Good morning, Mountain Citadel, and we welcome you as we worship together. Happy New Year, and I pray that uh, God's blessing on this 2021 uh, blesses each of you, and that uh, during this pandemic and everything that we're going through, that there is a light at this end of this tunnel. And I uh, just pray that uh, as we move forward, even during this lockdown, that we're able to connect and worship together. Um, we're thankful that uh, Courtney and our officers are able to have uh, some relaxing time during the Christmas season. And just a reminder that the court is closed, unfortunately, during this time. Uh, but we can't wait until we're able to open it up and uh, start worship again. Um, if you do know of anyone who is hurting or in hospital again, please contact the office by phone or by email and let us know. And the song that comes to mind, or the words, uh, I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands, whatever the future holds, we are in his hands. So God bless you as we worship this morning.
Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet you on this first Sunday of 2021. And what a year we've been through, but what a year and what an opportunity we have spread before us that God has given to us. And we are going to join in worship this morning, but I just want to share a prayer with you. Father God, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your being with us through the year that has gone and for all the challenges and, and differences that it held for us, yet we have found you faithful. And now as we look forward into 2021, we look forward with our hands in yours. We look forward to walk through this year with you at our side. We look forward to following your guidance and leaning on your wisdom. And so God, we just pray that this morning as we pause to worship you, that you would bless us, that you would be with us, that you would guide our thoughts and our hearts, and that your Holy Spirit would come and presence himself with us. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, let me share with you the scripture reading, taken from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And may God bless us with the reading of his word this morning.
that's good news. There's one more word. There is? Well, it's not an Advent word because Advent is over. There's a big word that we're going to learn today. Are you ready? Ready! Epiphany. Epi- what? Epiphany. Epiphany happens 12 days after Christmas. And that's actually the 12 days of Christmas. Well, that means we get to sing. On the first day of Christmas, aren't you lucky to? Eddie, we can sing that later. But for now, we're just going to learn about Epiphany. Okay, so like I said, Epiphany is 12 days after Christmas. That means it's always on January 6th. It's a special day to remember the Magi came to visit Jesus. Magi? Is that like a magic guy? Not really. The Magi are the wise men. The Bible tells us that after the shepherds and everything, the wise men came to visit Jesus. They think that by the time the wise men made it here, they were in their new home, a town called Nazareth. So they weren't at the manger? We don't think they were actually at the manger, but the important thing is that they knew Jesus was important and they knew they needed to visit him. That's right. And that's why it's so important for us to celebrate it because it helps us remember that Jesus' birth was just as important after he was born. It's good for us to keep talking about why Advent and Christmas are important, even when they're over. So we get to celebrate Christmas after Christmas is done? We do. It doesn't mean we get presents after Christmas or that all the Christmas stuff is the same, but we still talk about why Jesus is important. If the wise man thought Jesus' birth was important after Christmas, so should we. That's so cool! So Tia and Courtney, now that it's uh, epiphalent, can you tell me your favorite thing about Jesus when he was born? Epiphany. Epiphany, Eddie. But my favorite thing is all those words that his birth helps us understand. Love, joy, peace, and hope. Jesus helps us understand those things way better because Jesus brought those things with him. I love that too. I also love that God sent the shepherds who were dirty and kind of like not really well liked by people around them. And also the three wise men who were super important in the world. That means everyone gets to come to Jesus. No matter who they are or what people think of them, Jesus loves them and came to love and save every single person. Wow, that's really cool. I was going to say that it's cool that uh, Epiph, uh, whatever, is after Christmas Day. On the 12th day, there were 12 drummers and three wise men. Epiphany. And while probably not 12 drummers, that's just the song. But we also don't know exactly when they came but we celebrate it 12 days after Christmas so that we have specific time to talk about it. This is so cool. Thank you for teaching me about epiphany. Yeah, thank you, Tia. Thanks for talking about it. Bye. Bye, Tia.
Well, here we are at the end of our series, The Light Has Come. This Wednesday marks Epiphany, the traditional uh, marker of the visit of the Magi to the babe in Bethlehem. The word Epiphany, as Eddie and uh, Courtney have already uh, instructed us, means to give light. And so we look at the light of the star of Bethlehem and recognize the elements or the uh, various ways in which this star illumines our hearts and our minds. You know, it was very interesting this last week that we had an opportunity to observe in the heavens the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn in a way that hasn't been seen in over 800 years. You know, some scholars and astronomers suggest that this alignment, this planetary alignment, may very well have been the star of Bethlehem. Well, who knows what and how that star came to be, but what we do know is that it did come to illumine our hearts and our lives, and certainly illuminated the minds and hearts of the wise men who came to visit. You know, all light sh shone through a prism gives a various array of color and dimension. And we're going to look at various colors and dimension, if you will, of this particular light that came from the star and was followed by the wise men. The first way that the star revealed itself was as a star of disclosure. Our key verse in that particular passage is, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You know, I believe that this element of light represents God's natural revelation to all humanity. I think it's very interesting that these wise men not only came from a different country, but a different culture, and in fact were involved in astrology, perhaps the science of looking at the stars, which even in our day and age would seem somewhat pagan. But here God chose to reveal himself to these particular magi from the East. And, you know, I believe that in many, many ways this helps un us understand how inclusive this revelation of God is to all humanity. Christ didn't just come to reveal himself to the shepherds or the people of Israel. He came to reveal himself to the entire world. And none are excluded. And the visit of the Magi and the fact that they recognized that this star was different, this star was special, helps us understand that God really did want the world to see him in his fullness. God did not come just to the people of Israel, not just to a select few, but he came to them all. You know, the, op the opportunity for us at this time of year is to help reveal God to a world. You know, I wonder, and I, I'm often so excited about Christmas in, in malls and in, in, in the world and even in our school sometimes where carols are sung, music is played perhaps in a way that we, we don't allow any other time of the year but this is a wonderful opportunity and has been a wonderful opportunity for the church to put the word out to community, to put the word out to culture and context right around the world that we have seen the light of his star, and that God has disclosed himself to the world. Another element, however, that comes with that kind of disclosure is a element of discord. So not only was the star a star of disclosure, but in some ways it became a star of discord. We live in a world where people can be threatened by a message of peace, goodwill to all mankind. You know, some who would see this as inclusive, others would see this as exclusive, a threat to their own leadership and authority. This was so true for King Herod. 
as the wise men approached Jerusalem, perhaps thinking that they had figured out what was going on and came to the logical place of Christ's birth, the city of Jerusalem, the, the seat of, of rule and authority for the people of Israel, probably they expected to find that Herod's wife had given birth. But Herod said, no, there's no baby here. And with that, he was so concerned about where this threat to his authority was going to come. And so right away in the text, we see an element of discord, of disunity, of trouble brewing. When God discloses to all, there is always a threat of discord because there's always a threat that people will not accept this message of hope and love for the whole world. Some will receive the message with joy and others receive it with fear. The opportunity does exist, the real opportunity does exist to reject the light of this star just as much as there is one to accept it. And this was certainly Herod's reality. Herod's response was one of a threatened leader. And, he, and of course we all know that as this story unfolds, that threat, that concern, that, that insecurity led to him eventually going into the Bethlehem area and annihilating hundreds, if not thousands, of young men. You know, when God intervenes in his creation, he does upset the apple cart just a bit. And even perhaps in these days with COVID, we have seen our whole world kind of uh, uh, turned upside down, and, and God has allowed this all to happen, but of course in that there has been much confusion and discord as much as there has been opportunity. But we pray that this discord would not overshadow everything, but we have to understand it as a reality of light and love. Disclosure, discord, two elements of the star. The third element is one of discovery. Herod asked them where the child was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. And this was the beginning of a search for where this baby was to be born. You know, Herod's, Herod's, Herod's motives and the wise men's motives, as we've already discussed, are two very different realities. The wise men were earnestly seeking and trying to discover and discern what this sign meant. And as Herod became aware of it, so did he, but for all the wrong reasons. Interestingly, in this particular case, even Herod himself decides that he's going to work with the leaders and the teachers of the law of his day and move into Scripture to discern where the Messiah was to be born. You know, as we work through our lives and we see signs and symbols perhaps even in the heavens and we ask ourselves and we seek out what does that mean in a, in a an understanding of discovery what we have to recognize is that every single time when we are in those questioning periods the best resource for us to go to is God's word I think it's very interesting that Herod went right there what does God's word mean Say, where is this Messiah to be born? You know, light always invests, in, invites us to test its source. And scripture reminds us that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. That's why so many are fooled by what they feel and what they experience. And scripture reminds us in this discovery to continue to work towards discerning his, his will and his purposes and what he's all about through his word. Scripture also in invites us to test these spirits. And the best way to test these spirits is by their recognition of Christ as God. And we find that in 1 John 4, 2 and 3. And so the Magi went out 
from that place, understanding from God's word that this child would be born in Bethlehem. And they entered into a journey of discovery. Another aspect of the star's light is that it was a star of determination. You know, the, 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 the Magi were determined that they were going to find the child. After they had heard from the king, after they had found out where they were supposed to go, they went on their way. Once made aware of the truth, they were more eager than ever to see what it was all about. Certainly more than expected. Certainly, certainly very different than what they expected. Well beyond the courts of Herod. This was not a natural situation. This was not just a king a uh, child coming into the world. This was this was something different. This was something revolutionary. And so they were determined more than ever to find out what this star meant and what this story meant. They had to think outside the box. The king was born not in the royal court, but somewhere else. Something very phenomenal had transpired here and they were determined to find it. Not only was it the star of determination, but it was the star of direction. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. This is the first instant in the text where we really see mention of the star actually moving, giving clear direction, guidance to the wise men. Perhaps if they'd been following it more closely, uh, they wouldn't have landed in Herod's courts at all. Perhaps it's an it's a, it's a indication of human assumption, thinking, okay, we've got the answer to this, and we can take our eyes off the star. How many times do we make wrong turns because we've made an assumption of what God is all about and taken our eyes off the direction that he's giving us? And finally, when we find out that we've made a wrong turn or found ourselves in the wrong place, do we then look back to God to find where he wants us to be? This is something of what the, the Magi were all about at this particular time. It, the star wasn't the light that was the most important, but it was placed there to guide the Magi to the light that was, the light of the promised Messiah. You know, it's also a message for us to remember that we, we must not miss the greater message and be content with the lesser one. Yes, the star was brilliant in the sky, but the greater message was that it was there not to uh, help have, have people gaze on it themselves, but to point people to the Christ child, to the light of light, the Messiah. Not only was the star a star of direction, but for the Magi it became a star of delight. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. You know, I love this. I love this notion. The wise men are overjoyed about the coming of the star once again. It gave them excitement. It gave them joy. It gave them something to look forward to. Perhaps the star for us this Christmas season, and, and as we enter into a new year, is a star of anticipation, of delight, of joy. Recognizing that God has not abandoned his people, has not abandoned his children. We have joy, we have hope, we have anticipation for all of what 2021 can bring. You know, it's very interesting that as we have entered into this new year, we, we look back at 2020 and say, I hope we don't have another one like that again. Yet we do have to be careful. But it's our prayer and our desire, just as it is yours, that, that by this time next year, we will be seeing something more phenomenal and brilliant of a light that has come, not only in the world, but even in our church. I'm excited for this new year and all that it can bring because it gives us all kinds of new and exciting opportunity. The star of Bethlehem is a star of the light. As well, the star, and perhaps most importantly, the star becomes for us a star of devotion. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. You know, many times uh, 
people spent a lot of time trying to figure out what those gifts were all about. And by the naming of the gifts, assume that they know how many wise men were there. They always assume three. But the key to this text and the key action of all of this really is is that they came to pay homage to this king. They came to worship him as a king and present him with gifts. Perhaps this is what makes the most sense of the gifts. Remember, they thought they were entering into a royal court. You know, a humble family in a manger probably had no idea what to do with these extravagant gifts. They were probably outside their comfort zone and their price point. What do we do with these gifts that are usually reserved for, for kings and royalty? We're just common people. Christ was no common person. He was and is King of kings and Lord of lords and requires our most devout worship and devotion. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, because we are so familiar with the message, because we're so comfortable in God's presence, perhaps we don't always recognize the full devotion and worship God deserves. Perhaps we see him in humility and is one of us, as he wants to be seen. But let's also be reminded that the God that we worship is the God of the universe, the creator of all of the universe, the creator of us ourselves, and is worthy of our worship and devotion. Certainly the star of Bethlehem directed the wise men to worship him. Lastly, the star of devotion gives way to a star of discernment. The last verse of our passage says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, the star warned them. Perhaps it wasn't the star, but they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And the light that truly became evident to them was the light that truly gave evidence to the uniqueness of this child, to the fact that this child had nothing to do with the earthly kingdom of heaven, but everything to do with the kingdom of heaven and not Herod. You know, the star of discernment invites us, as we, as we mentioned earlier, to, to delve into the word, to test the spirits, to discern what we're seeing and what we're hearing, what we're experiencing, is it of God? My encouragement to you and to myself is that we would continue to look beyond our circumstances, continue to look beyond the obvious, and discern what God would have of us in these days. For the wise men, they knew full well that to return to Herod and to understand, and as they understood something, and were revealed of something of his ulterior motives for the child that were, that were borne out by his actions. Obviously, what they discerned was correct. We, too, need to be very discerning in these days. That we don't light, let the light of God's love, the light of Christ, be drowned out and, and misconstrued by by elements in our society, those who would be working against the gospel of Christ. Yes, that opposition will always, will always be there, and, and certainly the presence of Herod, and certainly the actions of Herod, and of course, as Christ went through life, the actions of Rome ultimately would help us to discern that that opposition, that a different worldview would always be at work. The star of Bethlehem helps us again to discern what is right, what is worthy, what is holy, and to recognize that Christ has come, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He is worthy of our praise. We're going to sing and listen again to the band who played this selection a couple weeks ago, but it's so fitting for our service here this morning again. Oh, come! Let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, for he alone is worthy. We have seen 
his star. But most importantly, we have seen him who is the light of the world. The light has come. We pray that you have enjoyed our series on The Light Has Come, our Advent and Christmas series this year. We're excited for the weeks to come and, and at one level are disappointed that we will not be able to meet with you in person yet in the building. But we are going to enjoy a series together on the book of Titus and I've been called it For Goodness Sake. So be sure to tune in weekly on the next few weeks through to uh, Valentine's Day for our series entitled, For Goodness Sake. But now, let's share in a benediction together. Father God, we thank you that you, the light of the world, have come for us. And we pray that we, your people, will commit ourselves daily to reflect that light in our life, in our actions, in our relationships with others that people will be drawn to that light through us, your children. Bless us through the year 2021 as we continue to do things differently, but perhaps get a glimpse of what our new normal will be all about. Bless us in this new year, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>